good morning. Welcome to Tabernacle Baptist Church. How many are glad to be in God's house this morning? Amen. I'd rather be here than in the best hospital in Greenville, South Carolina. So I'm thankful to the Lord that he allows us to be here. There's so many people that are sick today. Our pastor is sick today, but I think he's going to be preaching this morning. Uh, so other, so many other people have flus, but I'm thankful that the Lord has allowed us to be here this morning. Let's stand and turn in the old church hymnal, 359, leaning on the everlasting arms, and y'all sing out, okay? What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning. Safe and secure from all alone. Don't make me sing a solo this morning. Let's sing out, okay? Let's go up a step on our voices, okay? Let's sing on the second verse. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Safe and secure from all the harms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms on the last. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my. seated. I was told about three minutes ago that I was supposed to give the, <laughs> the challenge this morning. <laughs> so my, my mouth got all dried up. Now I can't hardly talk, but that's okay. Let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. And I know you've, you've heard this story before, but uh, I heard a song the other day and uh, it really touched my heart about the kindness of the King David. And uh, King David was asking, is there anybody in the house of Saul left? And uh, Ziba said that there is one, and uh, his name is Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth uh, when the Philistines attacked Israel, the lady that took him fell and he broke his legs and he couldn't walk. But uh, in the old times, when a king took over from a different family, he would usually kill all the families that was left behind so that they couldn't try to take over his kingdom. But David wasn't like that. Uh, but I'm sure Mephibosheth was in the lowly bar, probably one of the lowest places in Israel. And uh, he was afraid that King David would come and pick him up. And uh, so let's start with verse 5. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Micah, the son of Amiel from lowly bar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. 
And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And he was afraid. When he saw the soldiers coming down the road, I'm sure in his mind he thought, Oh my, King David has found the last person in Saul's family. And uh, now he's going to do something to me. He's going to take my life. And David said unto him, fear not. Because David probably looked upon Mephibosheth and saw fear in his face. Because he was afraid of David. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul, thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? And when I read this, I started thinking about myself. Here I was in sin, no hope, and Jesus came to me and saved my soul. And when I get to heaven, and I go before God, God's going to say, I'm going to show you kindness for Jesus' sake because of what he done on Calvary's. And each of one of us that are saved this morning, when we get to heaven, God is going to show us kindness for Jesus' sake. And I'm so thankful for what Jesus done for us on Calvary's cross. And I'm so thankful that he died uh, Dr. Aiken preached Wednesday night that he's not a babe in the manger no more. And uh, he did die on the cross for us. And we ought to be thankful this morning for what Jesus done for us. That God will show kindness unto us because of Jesus. And uh, I'm so thankful for the kindness that God will show us. And uh, if we can have some music play now and all the teachers can get up and start going to your classroom and then in just a few minutes we'll let the students go too okay let's all stand Okay, all the students, you can go to your classes, okay? Well, good morning. Hope everybody's doing well today. And uh, Brother Rose talking about that flu bug. I don't have the flu. I feel fine. Just sort of got frog in my throat, got his legs crossed. And uh, if I can drink enough coffee, maybe it'll <laughs> limber the frog up. Amen. <laughs> but it's good to see you today in the house of the Lord. Our ushers are coming. Come ahead, fellas, if you would. And uh, receive the Sunday school offering. Of course, today is a nice day in the month. And the last day of the year. What about that? Uh, I remember. I was thinking about that this morning. I remember my dad. Uh, I guess he was probably my age, maybe around sixty or so, sixty-five. And he kept saying, "I hear him say, hey, it's, it's going to get faster and faster.' And it's just like we just turn around here, 2018, looking at us, right? Just a few hours." 
however many feel that way. You feel that way? Yeah. Next year it'll be by faster. But uh, isn't that good news? <laughs> We're here and living. Amen. And the Lord has blessed us through this year. And uh, I trust he'll give us a good year in 2018. Uh, let's keep praying for our, some of our Sunday school people. Uh, James Logan, of course, has, still has some problem with his eyes. And I think his left eye, whichever eye it was, uh, I was told uh, he has some problems with both eyes now. So you pray for James Logan and Donna that uh, the Lord would help him. And then pray for Mrs. Violet Coker. She's still at home recovering from recent surgery. Then Brother Hank Falwell, Brother Henry's here, had a stint last week. And you can't keep a good man down, right? Just keeps on the going. We appreciate Brother Henry and his wife, Belle. And there's some other folks that uh, maybe not here today. I don't know some sickness or maybe traveling. But thank you for being here this morning. Brother David Edens is here, and he's going to teach our class. And uh, you continue to pray for him and his mission work endeavors. Pray for the uh, Kelly family. Naomi Kelly, we had her service yesterday here in this auditorium. And I pray for the Burns family. And the Lord would minister grace to them during these days in which they're going through. Brother David, you come, and uh, God bless you, brother. God bless you. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Hobart. We uh, appreciate this opportunity. And uh, I would say also pray for my wife. Uh, she's not well at all, and I've been very concerned for her. Uh, so pray for her. She would be here if she could. She thought she was going to get to come uh, last Sunday, but uh, it's just not been possible. She's very weak. It's uh, very labored breathing. And, you know, these medical doctors, they can do a lot of good, but they can also do a lot of harm. And uh, from the standpoint of our standpoint, as well as some other doctors that Donna has had now for since 2009, which is already nine years or seven, uh, eight, eight years at least, they are in agreement that uh, what the doctors did for her was not helpful at all. And so just pray for us and pray that the Lord knows. Uh, this morning we're still in Philippians chapter 4, uh, and I'm going to just read, beginning with verse uh, 13, we'll finish uh, this chapter, God willing, this morning, and I'm just going to read, uh, read the text first, and then we'll talk about. In verse 13, the apostle says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. And now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to have to read that again. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. We could read that all day, couldn't we? Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Remember Paul, as he writes this, is shackled to a Roman soldier. And uh, I don't believe you could be shackled to the Apostle Paul long without being touched by the message that he bore all across the known world at that time. And some of them had accepted Christ as their Savior. Uh, verse 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This is a wonderful book, and of course, all of God's wor word is wonderful. Uh, we will never fathom all of it. Uh, we uh, can sure try, though, and enjoy it. Amen. 
and we have enjoyed this, a very appropriate book to uh, study during this particular season of the year uh, because there's so many things there that the, the peace of God and joy and the same things that the angels proclaim to the shepherds and to the, uh, all of the people involved in Luke chapter 2 and also in Matthew chapter 1 and 2. And uh, so it has been a, a thrill to read through and to study this book. Uh, these Philippians in a Roman colony, perhaps, were being uh, uh, feared maybe being disenfranchised because they were Roman citizens automatically, the ones in Philippi, because it had been declared a Roman colony. But well, when the apostle was there right from the very start, uh, these Romans said, hey, these fellows are teaching things that is not, uh, it's not lawful for us Romans to participate in this. We can't go along with this. And uh, that was the case, and the Roman Empire did uh, put many of the followers of Jesus Christ to death, including the apostle who God used to pen the words of this book. And so it was with the Roman all the way up until Constantine in 300-something when he uh, 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 took over as the ruler of Rome. And for a while, on and off, uh, the Christians uh, began to be, uh, uh, have an honorable place. But that went up and down. And even during those times, uh, there were still Christians that were being martyred and being persecuted for the sake of Christ. And, of course, also Constantine's uh, situation did not necessarily help a whole lot in the end. But uh, this morning, in verse uh, 13... Uh, the apostle wrote, and he's speaking about his times when he knew how it was to be in want. He said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And it is indeed true that this is in the context of the fact that the apostle did without many times. Uh, but as he wandered uh, throughout the Roman world and uh, on the uh, shores of the Mediterranean uh, Sea uh, to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. However, let's don't just limit this verse to uh, our physical needs. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me because we don't have to read far in the New Testament in God's word to see that, that Jesus is uh, the one who strengthens us throughout our life. Uh, the enabling power of Jesus Christ. Uh, the apostle wrote to the Corinthians and said, our sufficiency is of God. He wrote again to the Corinthians and said that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I glory in mine infirmities. The power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Uh, then we read also... Uh, other passages in the word of God even from the Old Testament where God promised to be the strength for his people but one of the verses that is most uh, encouraging is Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 Christ in you the hope of glory whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus whereunto I also labor striving according to his working and which worketh in me, mightily. The words work here come from the word energy, and we get our word energize. So what is this? What is this that's energizing us? That is Christ in us, the hope of glory. He is our energy. He is the one that gives us the strength that we have. Uh, the Lord will give strength unto his people, the psalmist wrote in Psalm uh, 29 and verse 11. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. And so the apostle here is writing uh, concerning to, to the uh, uh, people in Philippi concerning his conflict. And uh, they knew him in conflict from the, from the very start. Because uh, just a few hours after he had been in Philippi, uh, he was in stocks in prison with his back bleeding and uh, lacerated by the Roman whip. And uh, what did he do? He sang and praised God in jail. 
And you know that's still going on today. I, I, I don't have time to t tell a whole lot about it, but this uh, Russian fella that uh, the Russians put in jail for 17 years because just because he was meeting all the churches had been closed down, and he, he was meeting with his children, just reading the Bible to them, telling them Bible stories, and in a little while the house was filled up. And the Russians didn't like that. They said, you're, you're, you're started a church here. No, no. Finally, they put him in jail for 17 years, told him his family was disbanded. They hated him and uh, wanted him to sign a paper saying, I, hey, I've just been doing all of this because I work for the CIA. And he was ready to sign that paper. But that night, God allowed him to see his family many miles away, still praying for him. And uh, one of his uh, things he did those years in prison, at dawn every morning, he would start singing a song of praise to Jesus. And all the prisoners cursed him. The, they beat him for doing that. The guards did. He was cursed. He was, they throwed ugly things at him, all kind of filth that took to, at him. He did that for 17 years. And on this day when they come to get him to sign this false statement, after God had showed him that his family was still praying for him, he told the guards, I'm not signing anything. Well, we're going to kill you. We're going to do away with you. They drug, drug him out of the prison. And as those guards were dragging him down the prison hallway, 1,500 hardened criminals began to sing Dimitri's song of praise to Jesus Christ. And he had a good precedent for singing in prison, amen. And those guards, they turned him loose. They said, who are you? Well, he was the son of God. He was a servant of Jesus Christ. Well, that's what the apostle started out in Philippi doing. And uh, so uh, we can say that God does give us strength. And I, in my testimony, after years being in, in Africa and what the Lord's doing over there, uh, it's, it's God's work. It's not that David Edens did it. I just had the privilege and honor to be there to just do a little bit. Just do a little bit. It was through the power and strength of Jesus Christ or we could not have survived. And uh, we praise the Lord. Well, greetings from our friends in, in, in uh, Niger because I know of at least a half a dozen places uh, in northern Niger where they met together to worship Jesus for Christmas. And I have photos of some of those. So uh, the Lord gives us the strength to carry through with these things. And I would notice also the acceptable sacrifices, well-pleasing to God. Uh, Paul told the Philippians in verse 18, he said, I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things. Epaphroditus was from Philippi, we believe. And they had sent him all the way to Rome to carry this uh, these things which were sent, they sent to the apostle. He said, I've received these things that were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Uh, notice the sacrifices that we give. We don't carry out. Now, if we were in uh, uh, North Africa today, uh, they have, uh, every time uh, you turn around, they've got a, a lamb or a ram tied up and what's that doing there well they're getting him fattened up and there's going to come a day when they take a knife and they they slaughter that uh, that uh, ram or that animal sometimes it's a goat and then they cut the meat up and you see that everywhere there's some festivities that they do when uh, they're just all over the place and then they roast those right out on the streets now some of the uh, Islamic people that go like to Europe they do the same thing there and sometimes those high-rise apartments, uh, they have to do that in the sinks, and it's just, uh, just messy. But, uh, you know, we don't do that. Even Moses and Aaron, and in the Moses, uh, under the law, they were always offering these sacrifices. But in our day, after Jesus came, our sacrifices are different. And we read about... Uh, these sacrifices, one of them is what the apostle is telling the Philippians for. They gave these offerings to the apostle Paul for his need. They didn't know what his need was. We don't know exactly what uh, the uh, offering was. It was uh, uh, a, a pleasing sacrifice to the Lord. It may have been funds. It may have been other things that he needed uh, that were well-pleasing to God. 
The apostle Peter wrote and said, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Not an animal. By the way, I will say about North Africa, many, many of the people over there, it's a time for them to eat something because many of them are hungry. And uh, they do that much, very much. Just a lot of them don't really understand what Islam's all about a whole lot. But uh, they do know, understand what it is to eat something uh, when you're hungry. And they don't have a lot of meat to eat over there as well. But uh, our, our sacrifices are spiritual sacrifices. And one of them is giving of our means. As the Philippians had done. And sent Epaphroditus. Uh, we also read in Hebrews. To do good and to communicate forget not. For with such sacrifices God is well pleased. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 51. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart O God. Thou wilt not despise. That's a sacrifice before God. A broken, a contrite heart. And again, to the Hebrews, the apostle wrote, By him, therefore, let us, by him being Jesus Christ, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. That's another sacrifice, the fruit of our lips. I remember earlier days in, in Tabernacle Baptist Church when we would meet. Many times we used to look forward to Wednesday night. Brother Aiken will remember a lot of this, and many of you will, because it's, it was a small gathering, and uh, people to start testifying. The fruit of our lips. And, brother, some of the greatest meetings I remember were back then. Of course, now there are things that uh, have sort of tied our hands, haven't they? But we should still give praise and glory to Jesus and to God through Jesus Christ. Giving thanks to his name. Just thanking God and thanking God. And we can always do that. Now Satan tempts us all the time to, to uh, have a sour grapes attitude. And we can always find things to be critical about. Everywhere we turn because we're living in a depraved and a corrupt world. But let's just praise God and give thanks to Him. We can always do that. That's never going to be out of line. Never, ever. The psalmist wrote again, Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare His works with rejoicing. And again the psalmist wrote, I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah the prophet wrote uh, about those that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We always, always are to always bring that sacrifice, amen, to the Lord's house. And Jonah, when he was in the whale's belly, he said, uh, after his repentance, he said, I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. Salvation is of the Lord. I believe there's a sacrifice of faith. The apostle wrote to these very uh, Philippians in this very letter in chapter 2, verse 17. He says, if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. I believe faith is a sacrifice. There are times when we are to just believe God. Just believe like the apostle when he was on that stormy ocean on the Mediterranean and there was no hope that they could be safe. They hadn't seen the stars for a couple of weeks. And that's what these navigators used to know where they're going. They hadn't seen that. They had thrown everything overboard. And the apostle Paul said, hey, I believe God. Right in the midst of that. And God will reward our faith. He said, if I be offered, poured out, actually uses the terminology there from the Old Testament, being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. And then uh, he wrote it to, uh, the, to us in Romans chapter 12, 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Hey, what are these bodies good for anyway? If they're not to offer and sacrifice to our Lord, to use as he would see fit. And he will, he will use you for his glory if you will give yourself to him. Now, maybe not something that's going to be published in uh, the morning newspaper. Maybe not even something that's going to be published in some uh, Christian newspaper. Maybe not anything that you'll even realize is happening. But God uses his people for his service. But notice with me also the everlasting supply from the unlimited riches of an infinite God. In verse 19 of uh, Philippians, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, I've always read this, realizing that this church, they were consistent and they were determined to help God's servant as he was carrying the gospel all over the known world at that time. And I take this promise is to them because they sacrificed. These were poor people, as I said uh, the other week. These were the Macedonians. These were the ones who were the poorest of the poor. Howbeit they were rich. But God made the, the apostle wrote this promise to them. God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So how much is that going to be? The riches of God in glory, is that, does that have a limit to it? I don't believe that has a limit to it. No limit at all. As some uh, uh, poet, poet put, wrote a poem, and I can't quote it all, but he, it goes something like this. God's bank ain't busted yet. Amen. Amen. And that's my testimony today. And God will supply your need. Listen, you, we can't outgive God. There's no way we can outgive God. You can give everything you have and you cannot outgive God. God shall supply all your need. Now, not all the things that we want. And we talked about what James said the other day to the, the Christians he was writing to and talked about how they lusted. And they lusted because they wanted things that they didn't really need according to the lust of their heart. But he says your need, your necessities, God will supply them. We can't outgive God. Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. That tells me we can't outgive God. We, God is not going to be indebted to any of us. Never, ever. And we're talking still here about physical, uh, material things. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses talked about giving to the poor. And he said, uh, Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto them. Ah, uh, uh, listen to that. Uh, we have pulled out our bill phone, and in our heart, uh, oh, this hurts. No. No, you lose your blessing. Be careful, don't lose your blessing. He says, don't be grieved when thou givest unto him, because uh, that this for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. And we could go today, and we could have a testimony meeting here, and there are people that would stand up and testify how God had blessed them, blessed their work, their job, blessed their home, because they gave. To the Lord and to the Lord's work. The writer of the Proverbs says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. And to the Corinthians the apostle wrote, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, there again. 
or of necessity. Oh, I've got to do this. No, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And the word there, cheerful, comes from the word hilarious, which is uh, like 60% of the English language, by the way. It comes from Greek anyway, so you can't get away from it. But the word hilarious, giver. Cheerful. God is able to make all grace abound unto you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. We can't outgive God. Uh, the, the earth is the Lord's, the psalmist said, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein, uh, all of it. And he says in one uh, passage, the cattle on a thousand hills. When I drive to church, I drive by about six fields that are filled with cattle, some of them sheep. And hey, I know the Lord, uh, the Lord's going to take care of me because those belong to my father. Amen. And, and if whenever he sees I need it, he can take of that and give to me uh, the, the uh, writer of De Deuteronomy Moses he says behold the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God the earth also and all that therein is I mean I, I believe that's a whole lot I believe that's a lot more than some of these multi-billionaires that we are here about today we've got amen because all of that could just vanish just like vapor overnight but my father, your father, owns it all. And it's at our disposable, at our disposal. Amen. But you know, there are other riches besides physical things. And we can talk about the physical things, but I read in Ephesians where the apostle wrote, but God who is rich in mercy. Hallelujah. I mean, I, I'd rather the, the writer of the Proverbs talks about eating a fatted calf in a place where there's no peace there. He said he'd rather dwell <laughs> and on the housetop alone. Be hungry if you've got peace in your heart. God is rich in mercy, folks. He's rich in mercy. And uh, we read also uh, in the, the, the psalmist, he says, for thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous. Plenteous also means rich. In mercy unto all them that call upon him. He says again in the Psalms, O Lord, thou art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. God is, is, is rich in mercy. He's rich in truth. And that means he, it'll never give out. Because God's eternal. Uh, to the Romans he wrote. Dost does thou despise the riches of God's goodness. And forbearance and long suffering. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. God has riches. He's rich. He's rich. That he might make known the riches of his glory. On the vessels of mercy. We need God's mercy. We need the riches of his glory. Hallelujah. And to Timothy, he wrote and said, And the grace of our Lord uh, was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So when you read this, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Amen. There's a lot to that. Amen. And I can't exhaust that now. We could have a whole series just on the riches of, of, of our Father, of the Lord God. But also, uh, let's read verse 20. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We could spend weeks just on that one word, amen. Amen. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you. Chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen again. Amen. <laughs> one time wasn't enough. Now I know some of the commentators and some of these other fancy Bibles, they leave the amens out. But hey brother, I, he's here. And you know that, amen, let me read this verse to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 
But as God is true, our word towards you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silphanus and Silas and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Hallelujah. We have a positive message. Nobody can accuse us of having a negative message. Or they should not be able to. Because all of God's promises in there, how many, I've heard 600. There are more than that, I'm sure. Some of them we probably don't even know about. But in Jesus Christ they are, yay and amen, hallelujah. Praise God. And I've got something else here that I read from Revelation. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right, Uh uh-oh. That may, be, that may be our day and age, you know. There are a lot of led to see in churches around these days for sure. These things saith who? Thee. Amen. The faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. Who is that? Somebody want to tell me who that is? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Amen. We were talking about amen the other day. Amen is a Hebrew word, by the way. There are lots of Hebrew words in English, too. I'll tell you right now. (laughs) Don't, don't, uh, Don't run from that. And the word comes from the Hebrew language. And it has a lot of different meanings. It means uh, to prove oneself, to be reliable, to stay faithful. Uh, It means uh, what is reliable. Is Jesus Christ reliable? Amen. I believe so. Faithfully inclined, entrusted with, approved. It also can mean faith, belief, to put trust in a person, to rely upon. The Apostle Paul wrote, I believe it was to Timothy and said, For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Praise God. Jesus is the Amen. And all the promises of God, he said, in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. God has a place for us in all this, folks. He has a place for for us in all of this, 100% fully, if you're a child of Jesus Christ. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, God's got a place for you in this. He don't leave us out. These promises. And I believe God is able to keep his promises. And he has kept his promises. He has never. And he will supply. He will supply. Uh, My God shall supply all your needs. As I said, it may not be material things. May not at all be material things. Uh, one of our sister missionaries, sister was lying in the hospital, if you could call it a hospital, in the early days of the mission uh, of the Sahara Project in uh, the Sahara Desert in North Niger Republic. And she was bleeding to death and uh, having suffered a miscarriage. Now, you have to realize if you were to go over to Agadez, Today, you would say, well, I don't really understand all this because things have changed. We're talking about uh, 40 years ago. And uh, just the airstrip was just barely paved. It was more dirt than it was pavement. Very, not very often a plane ever came in there. But uh, Sister Nancy was in the hospital. And the doctors, uh, they weren't any doctors, in fact. Just a midwife. And uh, they didn't know what to do. And an airplane landed at that airport on the most, one of the most remote parts of the world. And a man got off that plane. He was a French doctor. He came to that hospital, and they told him about this lady. And he, he uh, changed clothes, washed up, went into that uh, theater, and uh, he operated on Sister Nancy and repaired what was bleeding. Saved her life. Washed up, 
changed his clothes again, walked straight back out to that airport, got on that plane and left, and nobody knows who he was. Nobody knows why he was there. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. That's the promise. When it came my wife's time, uh, she, we were out there in the desert, and at that time, all the other missionaries had left or were on furlough. There weren't that many to begin with. But uh, my wife also was expecting our, our second child. And uh, so we were going to the hospital every few weeks, and the doctor at the hospital, a French doctor there at that time, this was in uh, 1975, uh, and uh, he was checking up on her. And then all at once uh, he announced that his contract was over and he was going to be leaving. He said, well, we got this uh, French uh, doctor over in the, on, in the military camp and he can take over where I left off. So uh, he was doing, uh, we were taking, going over to the military camp and Donna was seeing this other doctor. And uh, meanwhile, we met this lady in her 60s. Her, her name was Grace. She worked for the Church World Services. She was from the Grace Brethren uh, group somewhere, and she was a midwife. And uh, we would have her over for tea. She was a believer. And, uh, and she told us, she knew Donna's condition, and she said, listen, uh, if, you, if you all need me, just uh, let me know. So uh, this other doctor, number two, <laughs> he announced to us about two or three weeks before, uh, or a month perhaps, before our son was to be born, he, uh, he said to my wife, he said, I'm going off on vacation way up in the Sahara Desert, a place called Bilma. There's nothing out there but a prison because it's surrounded by thousands of miles, square miles of the desert. And they put uh, hard prisoners up there because they escape. They've got nowhere to go. Uh, they'll be probably perished from thirst if they try to get anywhere. But he was going up there for whatever reasons. I have no idea. Uh, curiosity, I suppose. But he said, Don't, not to worry at all. He said, I'll be back. I'll be back before this child comes, I'm sure. And so he, he left. Well, guess what? Seven weeks, seven, <laughs> seven days, ten days later, uh, Donna said, hey, it's time. It's time. And uh, so we went by the midwife and told her, hey, uh, we need your help. And uh, she said, okay, went with us to the hospital. And our son, t um, our son uh, Andre was born. And uh, we went home the same day. Now, about 10 days later, uh, I told Donna, let's go see if that French doctor's back yet. So I took her, the baby over there. And uh, I walked out, I said, you stay in the, in, the, in the Land Rover, in the Jeep, I'll go in and, and see the doctor, see if he's there. So I went walking in, that doctor saw me, ah, he said, Mr. Edens, he says, uh, peut-être, I said, pour he said, maybe it's for today, the, the birth of your child. I couldn't help but have just a little fun. <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. I said, there's been a surprise, uh, just a petite surprise, a little surprise. And uh, I, I think I saw him a little bit embarrassed. But, you know, he said, oh, great, bring them in. Let's see if everything worked out all right. You know, it was no accident that that lady was there, stationed there at that time. This was something that we were not equipped to deal with. But the Lord supplied that need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let me just say today that if you have any need, God's able to supply that. And uh, well, this is to the Philippian church and they're the ones that were given. Well, I hope you're giving. You should be. Everything you have belongs to God. You have nothing. The shirt on your back belongs to God. Well, I worked for it. Well, yeah, but who, where'd you get the strength to work for that? And I'm glad you did work for it. That's commendable, <laughs> but it belongs ultimately to our Father who is in heaven. And he gives every good gift and every perfect gift uh, comes down from above and is from our Father, which is in heaven. We have nothing that is our, ours, just ourselves. So uh, these are...
the promises that God gave to the Philippians. He, the apostle said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And uh, he says, amen. He seals this, seals this epistle with amen. And that great amen that we know is the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we know that he uh, will take care of us. He is the guarantee of the promises of Almighty God in this book. That is Jesus Christ. It's not an accident that the world don't like uh, us to talk about Jesus. It's not an accident that you can uh, get a, in a crowd in this world uh, venue and, and, and talk about other religious leaders and nobody has anything to say about it. You can be from the most cruel religion in the world, which you know what that is. I don't have to tell you what that is this morning. And oh, it's okay, it's okay. But anybody mentions Jesus Christ and immediately there's offense. And uh, the Bible talks about that. He, uh, th it says that he was the rock of offense. And the Jews were offended by him. And the Gentiles are offended by him. But you know, this book says, He that believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And that word ashamed also means offended. Hallelujah. He is the great amen. May his name be praised. So this then is our epistle of the Apostle Paul to the Philippians. And I, I, I read several places in the first chapter, just as we are closing this out, let's think about these places where the Apostle Paul talks about being confident. No matter he was, no wonder he was confident in chapter one. He says, uh, being confident of this very thing, confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. He signed the book at the end. Amen. 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 Well, our confidence is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, I'm confident of that. He, he talked about that once again in... Uh, in verse 14, many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds. Remember, everything that happens in our life, it's, it's not an accident. There are no accidents for us. Uh, God didn't just say, well, look at what happened to so-and-so. Look at what happened to, to, to Susan or what happened to John or what happened. Uh, we need to work this out. God had that planned. God plans our lives. And uh, Paul here, he is shackled in prison. But he said in one of his epistles, the word of God's not bound. But he said the very fact that the apostle is in prison, he said many of the brethren in the Lord have waxed confident by my bonds and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. And the apostle was confident of that. Let's not lose our confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, our confidence in God that no matter what happens, it's in God's hands. It's in God's hands. And in verse 20, he talks about, again, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing shall I be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be life or by death. Look at this world. Look at the view of his life that the apostle has. This boldness, which is akin, by the way, to confidence. This boldness. He's confident, even though he's shackled and in prison and don't know what the outcome's going to be. And he said, whether this works out, uh, for my, whether it be by life or by death, he says, I know that these things, uh, in these things, Christ shall be magnified in my body. And that should be the goal of our life, to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ, to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Verse 25 of chapter 1, having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. And as far as we know, the apostle was released on this first imprisonment. 
uh, and uh, did again visit Philippi. Uh, some who have studied uh, these, uh, these epistles and also the book of Acts uh, believe. So the apostle Paul then has wrote to these Philippians, telling them that our conversation as it becometh, uh, let our conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, stand fast with one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And as we mentioned uh, several weeks ago, it's a struggle, it's a battle, it's a warfare. And it's something that we struggle with every day we're attacked. I've noticed uh, from the beginning of our work in Niger Republic, everybody that came over there for any reason to work for the furthering of the gospel, they were attacked. They were attacked. And we will be attacked. Uh, we will be attacked. But thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And if we have that faith, we can be confident, amen, that God's going to get the victory in the end, amen. amen. And he has already, and he will continue to do so. Let us pray. We are grateful, Lord, for your mercy, for your love for us. We thank you for this book, Lord, that you've given to us. And as Jesus said, when he left the disciples, I will not leave you comfortless. He gave us the Holy Spirit. I will not leave you as orphans, but, but I will give you another comforter. And then he left us with this word, the word of God, uh, inerrant in its details, every jot, every tittle. And Lord, you gave us what you wanted us to have. Help us, Lord, to take this and to cherish it to walk in its precepts. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
If you can sing in the choir, let's come on up here and let's try to fill up the choir this morning. If you can sing in the choir, come on ahead. Thank you for being at Tabernacle this morning and appreciate you being here. How many are glad you're in God's house this morning? All right, thank you for being here. Let's turn to the old church hymnal on page 390. There's power in the blood. Let's all stand and we'll sing together. page 64 and we'll sing wonderful grace of Jesus and how my nerves have settled down now that I saw Dr. Logan walk in <laughs> uh, let's sing it out okay wonderful grace of Jesus
about the grace of Jesus. It was his grace that saved us and the blood of his that washed our sins away. I'm so thankful for the grace of Jesus. Let's sing on the last and give it everything you got, okay? Wonderful grace of Jesus reaching the most divine. may be seated and the choir will be singing now page 92. This is a special request. Someone asked us to sing this this morning and uh, we're thankful to sing it for them and we pray that it'll be a blessing to you also. Okay, pray for us as we sing. such a blessing watching people this morning sing that song without looking in your hymn book. And aren't you glad 
There are some of us I know in the auditorium, you have uh, got all kind of songs in your mind that you uh, wish weren't there. Maybe a time in your life you listen to the wrong kind of music and they creep back on a regular basis. Aren't you glad that you can put some of God's music in there as well? Amen? And uh, I, I, I just despise remembering the words of songs that I listened to when I was out in the world. And, but I love it when you know the words of the hymns without even looking in the book. Mrs. Emma Jean, I don't know if she ever looks in a book. Is she up there? I don't know if she ever looks in a book. Probably never listened to a bad song in all of her life. And, um, <clears throat> but I um, certainly do appreciate that. Well, welcome to Tabernacle Baptist Church. And if you're our guest this morning, I'm looking around the auditorium. I do see several guests this morning. Brother Nunez, good to see you, sir. You need to come this way. You're going to pray over the offering. Any missionary that can do a work down in Brazil like that, we want you praying over the offering. Come on this way, Brother Nunez. Just have a seat right over there. And uh, <clears throat> glad Brother Nunez is here. Amen. Um, several things to mention by way of prayer this morning, if you, if you just want to jot some of these things down. But Mrs. Veal will be having surgery on next Wednesday, the 3rd, and uh, they've asked prayer for her. And then uh, Carol DeWeese, Carol and Jean, they're not here this morning, um, but Carol fell and is really... She's in a lot of pain. They've gone back and forth to ER a couple of times. Roy, I'm sure you could relate to that. And uh, so you, if you please be in prayer for them, they're really, they're very, they're, they're just right now not in a good way. Also, <clears throat> Brother Jim Hill, continue to pray for him. Miss Barbara called this morning, gave me a good report on him and Brody as well. And then uh, Yogi Morris continuing to recover from her surgery. And the Kelly family, we want to keep them in prayer as well. So if you'd continue to do that. Um, also tonight after service, the, 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 uh, there will be a meeting of the outside uh, detail committee, excuse me, uh, before the evening service at 5 uh, p.m. in the high school department. Please check the list on the chapel bulletin board to see if your name is on the list. So church safety. And listen, church safety is something I think is important today. Um, that's not just something that we have for people to miss church and sit outside the services. Most of the men that I've talked to would rather be inside the services than be outside the services, but they want to make certain that we have a safe environment to come to. And you wish you didn't have to, have to say things like that. But in 2017, um, you know, we see again churches that uh, people have gone into and uh, just out of the wickedness of men's heart or by the direction of the devil, they've come in and, and uh, hurt our uh, people, the peep shot people. We want to make sure that doesn't happen here. So we have, I don't know how many people we have on the security detail, but many on that detail. And, uh, Brother Nally helps lead all that, and I appreciate that, so we thank him for that. Um, how, many of you, how many of you feel like you ate too much over the holidays? Would you raise your hand be honest? Okay, I see that. I'm going to put mine up as well. Hadn't been back to Alabama, I think, since September. September's the first time I'd been back um, in a year. And uh, that was a Wednesday night, and I think no, it was a Sunday. Well, actually, that was a Sunday. And then, we, and then when I went back this time, this is after Christmas, after Thanksgiving, one of our dear men met him at the church, and he said, my preacher, you put on a lot of weight, hadn't you? <laughs> Good to see you, too. <laughs> and then he just laughed. You'd have to know who said that and why he said it. But, uh, um, you know, if you feel like you put on a little weight, let me help you out this morning. Here would be a good solution for you. Put a little extra in the plate so you don't have as much to spend on like, junk food and donuts and whatnot. That'll help you with your diet. Amen? that sound good? No, it doesn't sound good. All right. But uh, at any rate, Brother, brother, uh, brother Nunez is going to come and pray for us. And then, but right before he does, um, I think that, that Miss Hawthorne is going to sing a song for us this morning that Dr. Aiken wrote. Didn't know Dr. Aiken wrote a song. Dr. Aiken, are you up there? You wrote one? Come on up here just a minute. Come on up here just a minute. He wrote a song, and uh, Brother Stevens was telling me that there was a particular reason why, an occasion, that he wrote that song. Now, there are some people that don't think you ought to sing anything new whatsoever. I disagree with that. I think you ought to sing anything that's a spiritual song, if it's a spiritual song. And this is a song, apparently, that God gave Brother Aiken, and I want him just to give you a little bit about that history. And then, Brother Nunez, if you'd... Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. If you'd pray. And then, uh, I was in a, a preaching in a camp meeting in West Virginia, um, Princeton, West Virginia, and Dr. Seidler was preaching uh, the night service. I preached in the morning and uh, some other preachers preaching as well. And uh, Brother Buzz Robertson was there, and um, the pastor, Dr. Siler, invited us to go out to supper with him one evening. And, um, and so we did. Uh, no, it was in the morning, I'm sorry. He invited us to go to lunch with him. I'll, I'll get it right. 
And uh, we were riding in his car to the restaurant, and uh, he said to, uh, to us, he said, I, I was reading a sermon by George Whitfield. And of course, George Whitfield and, uh, and John and Charles Wesley were instrumental in starting the Methodist movement, and then later they separated over some doctrinal positions. But anyway, uh, he said George Whitfield made a statement in this message. He said, if I, uh, if I can get it right here, he said, if I could trace myself from cradle to my manhood, I would find nothing in myself that I could commend. And he gave that statement to us, and he said, Brother Melvin, I want you to write a song. I said, Dr. Seidler, I've never written a song in my life. I have no idea how to start. He's, you know, like Dr. Seidler, he didn't take no for an answer. He said, oh, you can do it. <laughs> and so I knew that that meant just get it done, boy. You got the word. So I went to my motel room that afternoon with that statement on my mind. And I wrote two or three verses and a chorus to a song and, um, and I entitled it um, uh, Concerning Grace, and uh, it speaks of the grace of God. I can't even remember the title of it now, The God's Matchless Grace, uh, but uh, that's old age kicking in. That's the only song I ever wrote in my life and probably will be the only song. Now, Hobart, he's written 150 or more, but that'll probably be the only one I've ever written, but I appreciate uh, Mrs. Hawthorne uh, learning it and being willing to sing it and I hope it will be a blessing as she sings it. Amen. What a joy to be back at Tabernacle once again. Allow me to say this, Pastor. Our lives, they are not measured by the breath we take, but rather by the moments that will come and take our breath away. <sighs> Has taken mine away. Just to be able to be inside these sacred walls and knowing that God is here with us, has always been here with us. Today, 40 years ago, I stepped inside this building for the first time and joined Tabernacle Baptist Church. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we praise your name because we know you are good and your mercy endureth forever. As we come together, Lord, and assemble in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, what a joy it is for us to understand that we come as a family, the family of those who have been washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been forgiven. Grace has been so plenteously given to us. Thank you, Lord. Now we pray that you will continue to bless in the service and we renew our commitment as we have done in the many days before to give you some, something, our own selves, of so much you have given to us. We pray that you will bless the offering, and may we be mindful as we give God that our gift will just keep on giving. May the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ reach to every single soul worldwide. Please accept more than anything else our praises because we come before the one who is to us, Emmanuel, has been so in the days of 2017 and no doubt you're the God reaffirming your word that you will be with us in the days ahead. 
we thank you, Lord, for knowing from your word that the Lord is at hand. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. myself from cradle to my manhood I would find nothing in my life to recommend a helpless sinner lost condemned in need of one who would be friend and be my helper through the end Christ came to me oh just to Matchless grace and love sublime. I now am his and he is mine. In him forgiveness is confined. Oh, just to know my Lord divine would think upon me. All grace and mercy are combined at Calvary. When I think of what I was before Christ found me, no peace within the chains of sin completely bound me, no hope within my weary soul, no one to make me free and whole. Now Christ has saved my dying soul, I am set free. Oh, just to know my Lord divine, his matchless grace and love sublime. I now am his and he is mine. In him forgiveness is confined. Oh, just to know my Lord divine would think upon me. All grace and mercy are combined. From the pit of sin and shame my Savior brought me. When I was only to be blamed by grace, he sought me. All glory to his precious name, for I will never be the same. To lowest depths my Jesus came, he lifted me. Oh, just to know my Lord divine, his matchless grace and love sublime. I now am his and he is mine. In him forgiveness is confined. Oh, just to know my Lord divine would think upon me. All grace and mercy are come. Miss Hawthorne for that great song. Appreciate that. Let's all stand again and we'll sing page 143, My Jesus, I Love Thee. And I notice on the second phrase it said, I know thou art mine. Can you say amen to that? That he is yours. I'm thankful that the Lord Jesus is my Savior. All right, let's sing it out. My Jesus, I love thee.
fellowship. The choir's coming down, and let's shake hands with all our guests, okay? Good to see you this morning, and uh, honestly, there are a lot of people. I've had whole families call me and tell me, we all have the flu. We're all sick, and uh, how many of you are glad they stayed away? Don't raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. Please don't raise your hand. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I just was told just a moment ago, um, Josiah Edwards, would you stand, sir, and Princey Cotapago, they just got engaged. How about that? Isn't that good? And I asked, did you tell me the date? Do we have a date? We don't have a date set yet? Not a date. Just happy that we've made that next milestone. That's great. Well, we're happy for you. And I'm looking to see if mom and dad are happy, but I can't really see it from back here right now. Amen. Amen, Brother Sam. Uh, we, God bless you. Hope you'll pray for these kids and uh, these young people as they try to uh, begin to build a life together. You know, if, if, uh, if people put as much time into their marriage as they put into their wedding ceremony, I think there'd be a whole lot more happier marriages. What do you think? Amen. The amount of time spent on wedding ceremonies, and I'm not against it, uh, the decorations, um, the rehearsal, I mean, just so much investment. And, um, and then it comes to marriage, and you know, people say, well, I don't know why it's not working. You've got to make that same kind of investment. You get out of marriage what you put into it. And uh, you, can, you can have a great marriage. I believe that. I know the statistics say today that that's not really a good possibility of happening. But I believe you can have a good marriage. I believe God ordained it that way. Amen. 
and uh, we, we, we wish the best for them. And then uh, tonight, <clears throat> tonight, we're not going to have communion tonight. That's on, the, that's on the calendar, so the men that we're going to get ready for that, there's no need to do that tonight. We'll probably do that next Sunday, perhaps the first Sunday of the year. And uh, then tonight at uh, 730, we're going to have our regular service, but at 730, um, we've been invited to First Baptist of Conestee along with Whitehorse Heights and other churches uh, to come to a watch night service. It'll start at 7.30 and go till midnight. We'll pray in the new year, those that can. And uh, I've been told that somewhere in between there that they're going to have some food, I think hot dogs and other things like that to eat. So if, you, uh, if you're up for that, then you go right ahead. I, you know, I remember as a young man, um, the world watches that little ball fall in New York City. And uh, then they sing Old Ang Syne, all those other things like that. They make a big deal out of it. And uh, when I got right with God, I decided that I was going to pray in the new year, and I've done that many years, praying in the new year instead of celebrating with a glass of champagne or a glass of wine or something like that somewhere publicly, why not just go ahead and say, Lord, it's been a good year. I'm just going to meet you on my knees. Amen. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to encourage you, if you can, come to that. And, and if you can't, we understand that's a long time to sit. And uh, Brother Dean, Brother Dean said, I was hoping he'd started it at 9.30 instead of 7.30. But uh, nonetheless, we'll be there tonight. Take your Bible this morning, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21. Matthew chapter 21. I apologize ahead of time if I am hard to listen to this morning. But um, it is what it is today. Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to preach on a subject I believe I've already preached on here, but I do think it bears repeating. I'm going to come at it from a little different angle, and that is the word repentance. There was a time that that was a debated word, whether or not repentance was something that was actually a biblical doctrine. I don't know how anybody would miss that repentance is a biblical doctrine. Um, repentance is all throughout the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. It's in the Pauline epistles. It's in the Gospels. It's in the, it's in the, uh, the poetical books and David and Proverbs and uh, with, with Solomon. It's throughout the Bible. I think perhaps the debate was about whether or not a person acknowledged that they were repenting when they trusted Christ as their Savior. And that's not what I'm going to preach on. I would like to say this, though, about the word repentance. Repentance uh, the first time you find it in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 6. And God is the one doing the repenting. In Genesis 6, the Bible says that God repented that he had made man. God did the repenting. So repentance is not just about salvation. The first time you find it in the Bible, God is the one doing the repenting. All right, so we know it doesn't have anything to do with sin because our God is not a God that has any sin whatsoever. Then you later on read in Revelation chapter 2 that God tells the churches of Asia Minor to repent. He tells the whole church, not just an individual. He tells the church to repent. In fact, one of, I think, the best churches in the Bible, Ephesus, he tells them to repent and to do the first works. And it was a thriving church. I mean, it was a great church, and yet they had gotten off of kilter and they had kind of lost their purpose, they lost their way, they'd left their first love. And God told them, you need to repent, or I'm going to take your candle away from you. Now, here in Matthew 21, I'm going to show you what I think the definition of the word is, and hopefully that will help a little bit with understanding the word repentance, and then we'll, we'll look at some more Bible in just a moment. Matthew chapter 21, verse 28, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father, they say unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. In for John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. Now, there's a debate going on about Jesus' authority right before this parable. Where did you get your authority? By what authority do you do this? Now, how many of you would agree with me today that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh? He was not a created God. 
He was, not, he was not a God that was born. He was a God manifest in the flesh. The God manifest in the flesh. Now, that being said, he's the one that made authority. He's the one that created government. He's the one that created the family. He's the one that created the home. Everything that is therein, he made that. All right. Now, they're coming to him, though, and they're debating with him about his authority. So he gives them this parable. And he tells them that the publicans and the harlots are going to go into the kingdom of God before you because they repented. And you, you, you know the law. You, you keep the law. You have all these standards. You have all this about you that would say you are the prime religious people of the day. And yet the publican and the harlot are going to go in before you because they repented. Aren't you glad that salvation is not based on your stature and who you are and how religious you are, but instead it's based on Jesus Christ's finished work at Calvary. Amen. It's, it's based on his work, not my work. And they believed that. But he uses the word repentance here. And he speaks about this young man in verse 29 that said, I will not. He said, Father, I'm not going into your vineyard. I'm not going to do it. And afterward, he repented and went. And I say this morning that the definition of repentance that I believe is in the Bible is a change of heart that causes a change of direction. A change of heart that causes a change of direction. Would you pray with me and ask God to help us this morning? Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to stand once again here in this pulpit and open this precious book. And Lord, we want more than just a message today. God, we want more than just a sermon. Lord, we want you to speak to your people. We want your voice to be heard. God, help us to clear out of our mind anything that would keep that from happening. Help us, Lord, to have hearts that are soft and pliable that might be able to be touched by your word this day. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, repentance. A change of heart that causes a change of direction. That's what happened to this first son. He said, I'm not going to work. Now his dad, his dad comes to him and says, son, I want you to go to work in the vineyard. And he says, I will not. I'm not going. And afterward, he repented and went. He repented and went. He had a change of heart that caused a change of direction. I'm afraid one of the things we do today is we, we just want to see a change of direction. For instance, somebody's not in God's will. They're not living like they should. They don't really read their Bible like they used to. They don't really go to church very often. You know, maybe, maybe they've picked up a vice or a habit to where they're maybe out in places they shouldn't be, lifting glasses with things in them they shouldn't have in them. And we say, listen, you need to get back into church. We'd love to see you get back into church. There's nothing wrong with that statement. But you know what's better than that? You need to get your heart right with God, and then you'll find the place you need to be. You need to get your heart right. You need to let God change your heart so that'll change your direction. So many times we had the idea, well, we'll just take and we'll somehow, we'll kind of guide people into doing the right thing. If the heart is not where it should be, you can't guide people into living a righteous life. Can't make them do it. Maybe when they're five, maybe when they're 12. But when they get to be older, they make their own decisions. They get to do what they want to do away from everybody else. And, you know, I think it was Bob Jones Sr. that said this. He said, you are what you are in private, not in public. What you are in private, what you do in private, that's who you really are. And he says this, a, cha a change of heart is what caused this boy to change his direction. Now, I'm telling you right now, there's a lot of people in this world that need to change their direction. Amen. Need to change their direction. And, you know, when you think about repentance, it is necessary for salvation. I don't think a man has to say, I'm repenting. I think he has to understand he's a sinner, and he has to understand that Jesus Christ is the only Savior. Amen. Salvation is not just an escape from hell. Salvation is an escape from hell by a person who knows they are a sinner. Amen. If you don't know you're a sinner, then there's no need for salvation. It's just like if you don't know you've got a problem in your tooth, there's no need for the dentist to, to, to work on it. I, I'm not going to sit in a dentist chair, let him work on my mouth if I don't have a problem in my tooth. No way. I'm not going to have it drilled on, sawed on. I'm not going to get one of those big long shots. Good Lord, I'm not, I'm not even going to the dentist if I don't have a problem. It's 
That's why people don't come to God. They don't have a problem. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm better than him. I'm better than her. It's going to take more than being better than him or her to get you to heaven. You're going to have to have the righteousness of God to get to heaven. Amen. And the only way you can get the righteousness of God is if you understand, first of all, I am a sinner in God's eyes and I need his salvation. He's glad to give it. Amen. He's glad to give it. Repentance. Repentance is not just standing in a pulpit and saying, I'm sorry, with tears in your eyes. I think too many times in public somebody gets caught and to be able to somehow stem the tide of damage, they're brought in front of people publicly, whether it be a congressman or whether it be a preacher or whether it be a person in the church or whether it be an athlete and they come to that podium and they say, you know, I've done the wrong thing and I'm sorry and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to get the help that I need and I'm going to do better. They can repent, but that's not necessarily any signal of repentance. The real marker of repentance is that somebody's changed direction. I wonder if there's anybody out there that you ever found God and he changed your heart and then it changed your direction. Anybody beside me? Change direction. New Year's is going to be full of people making resolutions. As if that resolution is going to be the thing that carries you over into the next year. I think really probably what needs to happen is to change your heart. I love ice cream. All right? I do. I love ice cream. My mother had about, I don't know, 12 different kinds of ice cream in the freezer when we went home. And, um, you know, I can, I can determine in my mind I'm going to lose weight and I'm going to be trim and fit again and all those kind of youthful wishes. But until I understand that fundamentally you keep eating that ice cream, you're not ever going to be like that. It's got to be a change of heart. I got to quit eating those things. I got to quit eating those donuts, which I don't care for. You got to quit eating those french fries. It's amazing to me. I, and I, I probably need to get off this real quick because I don't make people mad. But, you know, if you supersize everything get a Diet Coke, I do not understand that. <laughs> I don't. You want everything supersized, big fry, and then it got all the stuff that goes with it, but I got a Diet Coke. I don't get it. Just go ahead and drink. <laughs> get the one that's got sugar in it. I need to get away from that, I know. I can go, listen, I can say in my mind, I am going to be trim. I am going to be fit. I'm going to lose weight. But you've got to change the way you look at what you're eating and what you're doing with your body. If you don't exercise and you don't eat right, you're not going to lose any weight. Oh, yes, I am. I'm going to take this pill that's going to make it work. That's kind of like what we do when it comes to getting forgiveness and we come to God. God, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say I'm sorry, everything's okay, and now we're just going to go on with life. No, you need a change of heart that causes a real change of direction. And then, then God can give you the life and help you do what he wants you to do with your life. This son is being asked to do something. Now, before I end up there, I, I want you to look at a couple of things in the Bible where, where do we find repentance coming from? What causes repentance then? Go with me, if you would, to Job for just a moment. Job 42. You know the story of Job? Job had, um, he had such an attack, an onslaught of the devil in his life, and uh, his children all died, and uh, he lost all of his possessions. He lost his health. Um, his friends that came to comfort him really didn't do any, any favor for him at all. And, you know, he's got this idea, I, I, I wished I could just talk to God, and finally God gives him his wish. And, and beginning in, in chapter 38, God begins to speak to Job, Job 38, Job 39, Job 40, Job 41. Look at verse four, chapter 42, look what he says, verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I, now, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholding from thee, who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. He said, I said stuff I shouldn't have said. Things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare, unto, uh, declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job said he repented after he saw God for who he was. I, I, I'd like to suggest one thing to you this morning, that repentance comes from being exposed to the holiness of God. 
the holiness of God. There is nothing like getting in front of something that is clean to see how dirty you really are. When you get in front of something that is clean and right and holy and good, when you get in front of someone like that, it has an effect on you if you're not in that condition. I think that's why the world wants the church to stay inside the church. Don't come out here among us. And now, we don't go out and we don't glow, but I tell you what, we ought to have a different language than what the world has. Amen. Amen. We ought to have different habits than what the world has. I'm telling you right now, listen, it doesn't matter where, what the situation is. If somebody puts alcohol in front of you, you ought to turn that glass upside down. You ought to push it away. Everybody ought to know you're not going to partake of it. Amen. We're different. We're different from that regard. And people come into a church, there ought to be the holiness of God inside that place. There ought to be something that says, hey, this is not just a new social organization. You can come in and have a good time. No, there's a holy God that has a holy Bible that holy men of God wrote. And that is something that the world needs. They don't need a Jesus like them, wearing blue jeans and flip-flops, just hanging out with the guys. I'm telling you right now, God's holy. Job, Job was a righteous man. The Bible says he was perfect and upright. He eschewed evil. He was a righteous man. But when he got in front of God and got to looking at God, you know what he said about himself? Goodness. I'm not going to say another thing. I repent in dust and ashes. I don't even hold a candle to you. We've lost that today. We've taken today and what we've done, we've made the church a place that is like the world. It shouldn't be like the world. Now, the world is welcome here. The world is welcome here. The world is welcome here, but worldliness is not welcome here. We don't want to be a worldly church. Somebody comes in off that street, and they don't have, listen, and they, listen, they may smell. They may have tattoos up and down their body. They're welcome to sit right here, hear the gospel, and maybe they get born again. Amen. 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 But holiness, getting in front of, and that's why it's important for you to have a holy life. It's important for you to have a holy life because for you to tell people about heaven and hell and about a Savior that can get them to heaven and keep them out of hell, you've got to have a right kind of life. That's why Lot, when Lot went to his sons-in-laws and said, listen, you've got to get out of Sodom, they mocked him. What are you doing talking to us about getting out of here and God's going to destroy this place? Do you really think we believe God talks to you? And I'm telling you, most of the world has a higher standard of Christianity than most Christians do. They've got a high standard. They don't believe you ought to curse. They don't believe you ought to have filthy language. They have a higher standard. But if you and I, if we would live a holy life and let that rub up against people, oh, the difference that would make. Amen. Amen. The holiness of God. We've lost that. Lost that. Look at it again, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. What brings repentance? Well, I believe the holiness of God. And I think when you keep removing the holiness of God out of the church, you're going to have a hard time to People to find repentance. And I mean a change of heart that changes direction. It says in Matthew chapter 3, verse number 1. And in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Strange place to preach, isn't it, in the wilderness? And saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John is going through there and he's preaching repentance. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I mean, there's not much time left. There's not much of an opportunity left. The king is coming. The king's almost here. You better repent. You better repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right there close enough to pick up. It's right there in reach. And I think what he's saying is this. Listen, the brevity of time is a reason for you As God's people, the Jews, you better repent because the king is coming. Now, how many of you believe that life is short? Would you say amen? If we believe life is short, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Is that correct? So somebody may say, well, next year I'm going to do better. You know what I think is a better thing to say? I'm going to start doing better right now because I'm I'm, I'm not taking tomorrow for granted. Amen. Brief period of time. 
There is no way of knowing what tomorrow holds, whether it be an automobile accident, a heart attack. Nobody has any measure. You can't say, all right, I'm going to live this many more years. And for some young people, I believe that's what the devil uses to really work on their heart. you got plenty of time to get right. One day when you're old and you're 30, 40, 50, and you know, maybe you can finally go ahead and get right, but you got plenty of time right now. You're going to have tomorrow, you're going to bounce back again. That is a lie from hell. Nobody is guaranteed another day. Nobody. And I think that John is preaching, listen, the time is brief. There's a short period of time and the kingdom of heaven is going to be here. You got to get you got to get right. you got to repent. You're going to see him. You know, one day when you die, you're going to meet God in heaven. Did you know that? Whether you're born again or not, whether it be at the judgment seat of Christ or the great white throne, all men are going to stand before God one day. Knowing that, we ought to tell people, listen, you need to get, repent. You need to have a change of heart about the direction you're going, and you need to do the right thing. Not only that, though, Matthew chapter 11 Matthew chapter 11, would you look there? Excuse me, chapter 12. We'll just skip over that one. Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12. Look, the Bible says in verse number 41, what brings repentance? Well, finally understanding the brevity of time, the holiness of God. Matthew chapter 12. Look there if you would at verse number 38. The Bible says, then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Show us a sign. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It's the only sign you're going to get, the resurrection. Verse 41, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas, and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. You know another thing that brings repentance? Preaching. Um, I am glad that I am not in a place where preaching has gone out of style. In fact, I, I think the majority of you are here this morning because you love Bible preaching. Now, when I say Bible preaching... That means the whole counsel of God. There are people they like to pick and choose what they preach on. They preach on this particular subject, that particular subject. They would never touch these other subjects. I think we ought to preach everything beginning at generation going all the way to the book of Revelation. Amen. From Genesis all the way to Revelation. Whatever's there, I think we ought to preach the Bible. If the Bible says something is sin, it needs to be preached. It causes people to repent. I'll give you for instance. How many believe that God is the creator of marriage? Would you say amen to that? God created marriage. God's the one that created the home. And because of that, what he did is he said that a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. In the book of Hebrews, the Bible says that marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled but adulterers and whoremongers, God will judge. Now, I'm going to say something that's contrary to society. I don't think you ought to have any kind of physical relations with a member of the opposite gender unless you've been married. So that is old-fashioned preaching. No, that is a timeless biblical principle. Well, nobody practices that. Doesn't matter if nobody practices it or everybody practices it. It's still a Bible principle. Amen. We, we, don't, we don't take and move in with somebody for six months to see if we can make it or not. When you get a wife, you, listen, you get a wife, it's not like buying a, a fishing rod down at Walmart. If you don't like it, you don't get to take it back. That's the Bible. And you know what I'm certain of? I'm certain people don't hear that preached today. They don't hear anybody stand in a pulpit and say, listen, if you're going to be physically engaged, then you need to be married. You need to be married. Why? Because God calls it adultery or fornication outside of marriage. But inside of marriage, he says, it is a gift I've given to you. Enjoy that wife that I've given you. And that is, that is a vanity under the sun that you get to enjoy. But you can't do it outside of marriage. Boy, and the world just says, well, 
come on, you know, isn't that a little dated? It doesn't matter, but if they heard it preached, maybe they'd get married instead of just living together. I've always tried to encourage some of our young people, listen, if somebody would move in with you and treat you like their wife or their husband um, without making the commitment, do you really think they're going to keep that commitment when times get hard? Come on, if you get married, marriages aren't perfect. Not one amen. <laughs> there is no perfect marriage. <laughs> Still no amen. Very few. Just down front, Brother Eden's brother, Brother Aiken. Look, there's no perfect marriage. So what happens is when the marriage isn't perfect, you've got to work out the problems. Not me. I'm going home to mama. Wrong choice. Wrong choice. Look, you got to work through that thing. That means if the marriage is way up here and you're making great money and you got everything you want and, and the marriage is really good and everybody's in good health, amen, you stay together. But if you're down here and there isn't any money and the house isn't what it needs to be and neither one of you in good health and there's all kind of problems, you still ought to stay committed because you said till death do us part. Amen. Right, that's just Bible preaching. That's not Baptist doctrine. That's not something we made up. That's something you find right in the Bible that God wrote. And if people don't hear preaching, they're not going to repent. So here's what I'd say. If you can't get somebody to come to church, get a CD and give it to them. Slip it to them. Used to at uh, my place of employment here in Greenville when I was in Bible college. Um, we'd have every now and then a guy that would want to get in my van that I was training him to how to do the job. And he'd want to flip over there to Rock 101 or whatever it is. I don't remember the numbers. And he'd flip it over there and I'd, I'd take it and I'd turn it back to WTBI. Hell, and he turned it back to what he wanted to listen to. Well, after a while, I just said, we'll just end this thing right here. So I just, I plugged in preaching. I mean, I just put in a preaching tape. And boy, and I'd ride around with that thing playing for a little while. And it wasn't long. You know, he'd say, I'll tell you what, if you go ahead and turn that preaching stuff off, he said, I'll quit fooling with that. No. <laughs> no more of that preaching stuff. <laughs> the world needs preaching. America needs preaching. Listen, Bible-believing churches need preaching. You need preaching. Come on now. I said you need preaching. No, my wife needs it. No, you need it. No, my kids need it. No, you, I need preaching. I listen to preaching. I go to places and get preached too. Why? Because I need to hear the word of God sounded out from a pulpit with the power of the Holy Ghost to help me change my heart so I can go the right direction. Amen. Amen. Preaching. Preaching. Not only preaching, taking a look if you would over at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We'll have two more stops and we'll be done this morning. What brings repentance? Preaching. The holiness of God. Seeing the brevity of time. Romans chapter 2. as The Bible says in verse number Three, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? You know, preaching, preaching can help bring repentance, the holiness of God, but the goodness of God. And I I've got an entire message here on the goodness of God that I'd love to preach this morning, but I'd, I'd like to say this. Can't you say that God's been good to you this year? I mean, regardless of your level of commitment, whether you're a sold-out, Bible-believing Christian that is doing all you can with the life God's given you, or whether you're a nominal Christian, or whether you're somebody that's backslidden, God's been good to you if he's given you your health, he's given you breath, He's given you a job. Listen, in America, we have been so blessed in this country. Um, I was told, I was told by uh, my brother who went down to get some meat for us to eat at Christmas dinner that at the Costco in Huntsville, Alabama, that they sold $750,000 worth of meat before Christmas. And the man told him that if they'd have had more, they'd have sold it, but they ran completely out of the meat. And now... And now, if you wanted something, you just have to wait until January for a new shipment to come in. What I'm saying is we've been blessed. And you, you may not understand that. That may not be something that, that you can see. But when he says here, 
the riches of his goodness and his forbearance and long suffering. You can go into the book of Ezekiel and look at how he treated Israel. Rebellious. And yet God was still good to Israel. You can go to the book of Hosea. And God tells Hosea to marry a harlot so that he can show the nation, this is how I've been treating you. And he's been good to her. And I'm just saying this morning, listen, God, God has been good to, to you this year. No matter whether you decided to follow his directing or whatever else, he's been good and he's been long-suffering. Aren't you glad, aren't you glad that God is long-suffering? I mean, what if, what, if this, what if this father in this parable we read about, what if, he, what if he immediately went to that boy that said, I will not? And what if he just, what if he wore him out? What if he had him removed from his home? Get out of my house. If you're not going to work, get out of my house. If you're not going to go work in our family vineyard, get out. What if he brought down severe, harsh judgment and probably rightly deserved? You think about that, a grown boy looking at his dad and his dad says, hey, son, I want you to go out and work in my vineyard. And he says, no, I'm not going to do it. You're not going to make me do it. Aren't you glad that God is long-suffering and that he forbears with you and I when we don't do right and he gives us space to get right? Isn't that a blessing from God? And you may be here this morning and God, you know God's given you that space. Oh, I knew God was giving me a space to turn around. That space wasn't just a moment, but God gave me many years, year after year. Something would come up. There would be, a, I mean, just a terrible uh, thing happen in my life. Going into the hospital, wrecking a vehicle, doing something else, and then God just give another space of grace. He just leave that thing out there. And boy, I'm, I'm telling you this morning, I am so glad that we have a good God and we have a God that is gracious and merciful and long-suffering and gives us time to have our heart changed so we can go the right direction. The goodness of God. God's goodness. You know, maybe that boy got to think about, you know, Dad, you know, Dad has kept me in, he's kept me in clothes, kept me fed. We've lived in a nice place for a long time. That's just not really reasonable for me to tell him no. Maybe he got feeling bad about saying no to his daddy. Maybe he got to looking at the age on his dad's face. I have no idea, but somehow something changed his heart. He said, you know what? If dad wants me to go in that vineyard and work, I'm going to go. The goodness of God. Last thing we'll look at then, I'm finished, 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. What brings repentance? The goodness of God, the preaching of the word, an understanding of the brevity of time, God's holiness, all that brings repentance a change of the heart that changes direction. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Corinthians is written, or the Corinthian church is written back and forth to Paul, and they've had this big problem in the church. They've had a man um, who has uh, basically committed uh, immorality with his father's wife, and, um, and Paul has written to them, you need to deal with that. You've got to deal with that. And so they deal with it. And then there comes the question, well, should we allow this man back into our fellowship now? And, and uh, maybe now they've really gone to the place where we, we, don't, we don't want this guy around. But Paul writes back, and one of the things he says down here in verse number 8, if you look at it, for though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. So he wrote them a letter, told them what they were supposed to do. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourself, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. He says you had this idea that you didn't need to deal with this immorality that even the Gentiles won't accept. 
So I'm going to write you a letter about that. Paul writes that Corinthian letter. They get that. He tells them if they're to part company with a brother that's a fornicator or an idolater or an extortioner, they begin talking among themselves and they finally take care of the issue. But they're broken hearted about it. This is awful. And he says, look, I'm glad that you sorrowed after a godly sort. You didn't just have tears in your eyes. Look, isn't it so funny? I, I was taught years ago that if you go into a room after you hear a crash or you hear somebody squalling and you step in there and you walk and the first child looks at you and said, I didn't do it, that's the one that did it right there. That's the one that did it. It wasn't me. <laughs> oh, 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 what? I didn't even ask a question. All right. And you know, when you get caught and those big crocodile tears come up, I mean, there's, there's probably not anybody in here that was disciplined by your parents that when, dis, when, when it was known you were going to be disciplined, didn't you just begin to cry? Well, I, I don't know if you began. I, I began to cry already. My dad, my dad, my dad, when he would discipline us, he would, uh, dad was the one, he would say, look, he gave you one opportunity. And after that one opportunity, then you're going to get disciplined for it. Mom wasn't that way. Dad was that way. Dad would get up out of that chair and when he started walking to his bedroom, and he kept all of his ties and belts and all these things on the back of his door. When that door swung and we heard all that clanking, oh, listen, I was already crying before he ever came around the corner. Dad, I promise I'll never do it again. I said those words. Dad, I'll never do it again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll never. You know what really I was saying? Please, please, that's good. Please, I, uh, please stop. Please, I, 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 don't want, I, don't want, I don't want to be disciplined. I, don't want, I, I feel like I can't even say the word spanking. I don't want to be whipped. Good, not like anything to make it stop. That wasn't real repentance. That was just me saying, boy, I'm, I'm caught. I'm in trouble. But you know, when you turn and you see yourself for who you are and it breaks your heart, you know what that is? That's a godly sorrow right there. That's what the prodigal son had. The prodigal son lost everything he had, spent it all. He's sitting in a hog pen. He's looking at the husks that the pigs did eat. And he comes to himself and he says these words. He says, he's going to get up and arise and go to his father. And he's going to say these words. I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no longer worthy to be called thy son. In other words, he's going back and he's saying, Father, I have sinned against God. The way I'm living is wickedness. I understand. It's wrong. I'm living a bad life and I've done it. I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you and I want to get right. He didn't just go back crying saying, Dad, I'm tired of smelling bad. I'm tired of being hungry. Oh, I'm tired of being out there with all the problems. No, he repented of what he was on the inside. He had a change of heart that caused a change of direction. And that godly sorrow Esau wept, found no repentance. Peter wept and found a place of repentance and was restored by God. You know why? One repenting over what he is, the other repenting over what he had done. Now, go back to Matthew 21 and I'll finish. Matthew 21. Talked about repentance today as a change of heart that causes a change of direction. A change of heart that causes a change of direction. And we talked about how that preaching can help bring repentance. The goodness of God can help bring repentance. Godly sorrow, seeing yourself for what you are, can help bring repentance. The brevity of life seeing that there's not much time can help bring repentance. The holiness of God. Now I want you to look back at the passage again, Matthew 21, and just look. The Bible says in verse 28, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today. Today. In my vineyard. One day. This day. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. God gave that young man something to do. His father gave him something to do. And he said, I want you to do it today. Now, there may have been something God wanted you to do in 2017, and you didn't do it. Maybe it, was a, maybe it, maybe it had something to do with being saved. Maybe you're here this morning, you didn't get saved. We've seen some people saved this year. Isn't it a blessing to see people saved? 
Maybe God knocked on your heart's door and you said, no, I'm not getting saved. No, I'm not going to do it. All right, I, I'm going to put it aside one more time. You know what would be good for you to do today? It would be good for you today to get born again. Today. It might have to do with service. We had some young men step up and said, you know what, I believe the Lord's called me to preach. Maybe God asked you to do something for him, whether it's called to preach or whether it's in a church or in your community, in your town, whatever. It may be at the place you work, but God wanted you to do something, and he asked you to do it. And you said, you know, Lord, not right now. I'll do it later. Or maybe it had to do with sanctification. Maybe God put his finger on something in your life, and he said, you know what, I want you to take this and get it out. Or I want you to take this and put it in. And you said, you know, not right now, Lord, I just don't have time. You know what the Bible says? But afterwards he answered and said, I will not. Or but he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. He said, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to do what you asked me to do. Might be forgiving somebody that God's touched your heart about forgiving. You hadn't done that yet. Might be being a witness to somebody God spoke to you about. But here's, here's, here's part of my invitation this morning. Wouldn't today be a good day, the last day? Or the last Sunday of the year, you say, God, you know, whatever it is I'm supposed to do today, I'm going to start stepping that direction. I wonder, would there be anybody get up out of your pew and just come to an altar and say, Lord, today I'm going to make that step. Sanctification, salvation, or service. Is there anybody like that? You just get up. Amen, son. Amen, California. Anybody else? Today. Come on, you've talked about it a long time. God, God's knocked on your door a long time. Listen. He's been knocking on your heart's door a long time. Why don't you do that thing today? Come on, would you get up and join these? We'd be happy with you. They were rejoicing when that prodigal came on. Amen, John. Anybody else? Amen, Caroline. Anybody else? Come on, you've talked about it a long time. Why not today? Why not today? Amen, Chris. It doesn't have to be you're coming and confessing sin. I'm just going to do what you asked me to do, Lord. I'm going to commit today. God, I'm, I'm going to take today, and I'm going to get that out of my life. I'm going to put that in my life. Would you come this morning? It would be a great way to end the year. A change of heart causes a change of direction. Well, while these are here at the altar, you know what I'd like to encourage you, though? I, I don't think prayer necessarily brings repentance, but it does keep God being good to that person. It does keep his holiness bumping into their presence. It, it, it got, God is touched, I think, by prayer. I wonder if there'd be any moms or dads or whoever, wife, husband, whatever. You get on the altar and you say, God, would you help? And, and call them by name. God, would you help them this year? Help them to repent this year. Help them get right. Help them whether it's to get saved or whether it's to to get their life in order, would you step out? Thank you. Amen. Anybody else? You just get up out of your pew and just say, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask God to help. Amen. Amen, Owen. Amen, Miss Bolt. Amen, BJ. Anybody else? You just get up and say, boy, I'm, I'm going to be on the, I'm, God, I'm going to keep knocking on that door. God, would you cause their change of heart? Not just a change of direction. Change their heart. Amen, John. Anybody else? Would you come this morning? Repentance is really... A hard thing to do. You say, well, they'll have enough problems in their life and they'll repent. Not according to the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, they suffered so many things. You know what the Bible says three times? And they repented not. The trouble didn't bring the, it, 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 it didn't make the repentance happen. It made them angry. Come on, would you come and join these this morning? Brother Hogarth, you want to come and play that organ while we got some folks praying? Lord, we thank you for today. God, we thank you that there's always a door, a space, an opportunity that we can come and we can give you the reins of our life. And Lord, I remember that day, and I praise you for your, your grace, your mercy. Thank you for that. And I, I know today, Lord, in this auditorium, I know that there are strivings in the heart. I believe that. I believe there may be people listening today by way of Internet. There's strivings in their heart about just obeying and doing what you've asked them to do. And I pray you'd help them, help them to have the courage to let you change their heart, and then, Lord, help them to change direction. Lord, we praise you for the victories won. 
Praise you, Lord, for this example of a young man that went ahead and did what his father asked him to do. Lord, we rejoice over stories like the prodigal son, over the picture of you restoring Israel. Lord, we rejoice over those things. I pray, God, you'd, you'd help us to see more of that this year. In Jesus' name, amen. While folks are praying, Brother Holt, you'll sing. <clears throat> Appreciate your attention this morning. Brother Josh Sanders, come on this way, son. He's going to dismiss in a word of prayer. His brother is in Washington, D.C. Is that correct? I got that right, Trace. Is he already there? And uh, going to be there for a year. And I want you to pray for him. And uh, he was asking about a good church to go to. Isn't that a blessing? Got moved to D.C., but he didn't get moved away from God. Amen. And if you stand to your feet, and uh, we're going to be dismissed with a word of prayer. Josh going to dismiss us. And we'll be right back here tonight. At uh, 6 o'clock, we've got that uh, meeting at 5, and then at 7.30, we'll be over at First Baptist Conestee. How many are glad you're saved? Could you say amen to that? How many are really glad we got a lot of guests with us this morning? Can you say amen to that? Glad they're here. Brother Nunez, glad you were here today. 40 years ago, today, joined Tabernacle Baptist Church. Amen. How many churches, how many churches does God use you to help plant? Four churches. God has used you to help plant. How about that? Praise the Lord. What a blessing. Isn't it good to have somebody like that from your church to do something like that for God? Isn't that a blessing? I was thinking about today. Brother Edens. Where would Brother Edens go? Brother Edens. Talk Sunday school. Well, we got well, what a blessing to have Brother Edens teaching Sunday school. How many of you like to hear him do it again? We're going to do it again. And then hear a song that Dr. Aiken wrote. Boy, it's setting the bar real high for me, Brother Aiken. I don't know if I could write a nursery rhyme. You wrote a song right out of a book that night. That's great. That's great. That's great. Well, Josh, dismiss in order of prayer, would you? Lord, we thank you for the service. We thank you for the preaching of the word. And we appreciate all the people being here. And we pray, Father, that you'd be with each and every single one of them. And I pray especially, Lord, for my brother, that you'd help him. And God, that you'd just be with us on this Sunday, Lord's Day. And we just thank you for the service. In Jesus' name, amen.